Welcome to the Airline Weekly Lounge. I'm your host, Edward Russell, and this week we bring you my chat with Air Lease Executive Chairman Stephen Udvarhazi at the first in-person Skip Aviation Forum on November 16th. Enjoy. Please welcome Executive Chairman of the Board at Air Lease Corporation, Stephen Udvarhazi, in conversation with Skip Airline Weekly Editor, Edward Russell. Good uh, almost afternoon, everybody. Um, happy to be back on stage. Before I kick off with, with my guest, Mr. Stephen Uvarhazi, who almost needs no introduction, I just want to say if you have any questions, please submit them in the app or online, and we'll be able to see them up here in the last five minutes of the session. But as I said, I'm here with Mr. Stephen Uvarhazi, executive chairman of Air Lease Corp, uh, widely known, accredited as the father of the modern leasing industry, who famously started out of his car in Santa Monica in the 1970s. Welcome to the stage. Thank you very much, Ned. So, well, Mr. Hazi, in, uh, in, in your work at Air Lease, you talk to airlines around the world. Uh, you get a lot of different perspectives. We had American Airlines CEO Robert Isom up here earlier talking about demands remaining robust despite uh, the concerns. What's, uh, what are you hearing from airlines right now? How's how things look? Well, I think we have about 140 airlines that lease jet aircraft from us on all continents. We're in 85 countries. So I, I can second what Robert said. I think the airlines grossly underestimated the resurgence in demand as the pandemic sort of uh, died out uh, in, in the early part of this year. And... Uh, most airlines were not equipped in terms of infrastructure, labor, pilots, uh, ground agents, maintenance facilities to cope with this tremendous uh, increase in demand. So we saw big gaps in the ability of airlines to kind of recover and get back to some level of normalcy. And some have done better than others. But the U.S., obviously, we have a lot of media attention to to the issues and flight cancellations and ATC problems and and uh, and now of course we have labor flexing their muscles as airlines are making profits. Uh, they want to recover what they've given up in the last three four years. Right. So it's it's normal human behavior. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I, I think uh, there was a lot of press recently about sort of Delta pilots and how it could disrupt holiday travel, though. I, you know, it's, the process takes more than just a strike vote, so it's, uh, it's, it's a negotiating ploy for, for all intents and purposes. But, you know, so the U.S. is, is good. You know, in Europe, uh, of course, the pressure from high energy prices is a lot more severe than it is here and everything. Are, are you hearing from airlines there any concerns about sort of pulling back or anything? Well, I think, I think Europe had a very strong recovery uh, starting late last year. Um, and what surprised the airlines is the discretionary travel, particularly to southern Europe, the Mediterranean region, was extremely strong. It already surpassed 2019 uh, traffic volume levels. But on the other side of the equation, business travel between business hubs, like between, say, London and Brussels or Copenhagen and Paris, were significantly below uh, previous levels. So the whole market dynamic and distribution where the traffic flows are was, was sort of unprecedented. Yeah. I mean, it's, you mentioned Southern Europe. I read about Aegean Airlines uh, third quarter results, and they're one of those profitable airlines yeah. in Europe because everyone wants to go to Greece, apparently. Yeah, Greece so. did very well. I mean, they, as a country, they were in bad shape five, six years ago and, and made tremendous recovery. But I think Portugal, Spain, Italy, Greece um, enjoyed robust traffic increases uh, and had some degree of difficulty keeping up with uh, hotels and ground arrangements to accommodate all these travelers. And that's always always the problem, as we know, in the travel industry, it's not just getting there, it's, it's your entire trip. 
you know, one market that has, is, is not yet as fully back as Europe and the US is Asia Pacific. Um, you know, we, we talked a little about China is such a big piece of that. Of course, China's borders remain closed. You know, what, what is your, your view of what's happening there and, and where that's gonna go? Is it just is it gonna follow the same track or something different? Well, there's an immense contrast between what happened on the North Atlantic this year, uh, where I think both traffic levels and yields far exceeded airlines' expectations compared to the North Pacific and then long-haul traffic to and from uh, Asia. Uh, and it's, it's, a lot of this is really due to the uh, lockdowns, travel restrictions, quarantines, uh, limitations on, on uh, quotas and how many passengers can come in and out of airports. So Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, they're, they were all very slow, kind of behind the power curve on recovering uh, because they were all scared of another, another wave of a new form of, uh, of the uh, COVID. All right. I know they seem to be opening up with, uh, I mean, Japan, Taiwan have all dropped their, their interest, I mean, except China, but they seem to be embracing the return of travelers this winter. And they are. So. They are. Because I think it had a very negative impact on their overall economies and particularly Southeast Asia, uh, tourism is such an important part of the uh, GDP. Right, right. Um, like in Indonesia, Thailand, uh, good examples of that. Yes, yeah, Thai Air Asia just said they're expecting uh, tourism numbers hit 10 million for the year after, I mean, they have less than half a million at the beginning of the year. So it's a crazy, it's, it's, the rebound is impressive, but it's still not back to 2019, that's for sure. No, so it's gonna take a little longer, but I think, I think, the middle class is growing. I think uh, people are eager to travel, and and I think governments will come around. It's just uh, they're a little bit behind the times. Definitely. So you know, one topic that has come up uh, across the airline industry is consolidation. Now, it's yeah. always been generally it's viewed that larger airlines are more profitable. Can you know they have better pricing power? They can grow more. We've seen that in the U.S. But talks have sort of restarted uh, pretty quickly in Latin America. Now in Europe, we're hearing all of these potential deals. I mean, what, uh, what's your view of, of consolidation now? Well, is it actually going to happen now? Well, there's already been a lot of consolidation. First, let's talk about Europe. You've got the uh, IAG group. Uh, that already includes Aer Lingus in Ireland, uh, British Airways, Iberia, Welling, and then a very strong uh, foundation for the One World Alliance. Then you've got the Air France KLM group, um, and then the Lufthansa group that already controls uh, Brussels Airlines, Austrian and Swiss. Right. So those are the three sort of pillars of European uh, uh, consolidation. And then you have the large LCCs and ULCCs, Ryanair, EasyJet, Wiz, and Welling yeah. being the largest, and Norwegian trying to get back into that category. Uh, I don't really see a lot of consolidation among the ULCCs at this point okay. because the egos are pretty pretty strong. Okay. Um, but there are airlines in play. I mean, eventually SAS might be a candidate. Uh, ITA, uh, which is the successor to Alitalia. Uh, there are initiatives from both Lufthansa and from uh, Air France KLM to take a, uh, a strategic position in ITA, and then you've got TAP uh, Air Portugal. Yep. I would say those are the main targets uh, right now for potential consolidation. Uh, you... South America, I mean, th there's cultural issues there. For example, the uh, LAN taking over TAM in Brazil, it, it, it's been an imperfect merger, um, and uh, They've gone through a very expensive bankruptcy restructuring process. Uh, the company will emerge better, but it's still, it's still not an optimal situation. Interesting. I mean, that raises the, at least in Latin America, um, we're going to hear from John Rogerson, the CEO of Azul, uh, later today. But you know, cross-border consolidation, like you said, has not always met the expectations that it, it you know, people have for it. In Europe, it's arguably been more successful. I mean, is that just because Latin America is still essentially a collection of 10, 15 different markets that... Yeah, and, and there's political considerations because a lot of these countries want to have a flag carrier 
and they don't want to have domination from outside the country. To give you an example, Peru, uh, which is the largest on the, on the West Coast, does not have a flight carrier. They used to have a flight carrier, but now it's essentially uh, foreign airlines that dominate the Peruvian landscape. Right. Uh, but I was just recently down in Alta in Buenos Aires, met with all of our Latin American CEO uh, airline clients. And right now, I think Latin America has got the best traffic growth across the board of any region. Yeah, I mean, to the, that point, it's, uh, I mean, they've recovered sort of the fastest in terms of, in terms of traffic so far in the pandemic. I think in the latest numbers I saw, which were for August, uh, it's, people are definitely back though. I, I do note that, you know, when I, sp I was also at Alta, a lot of the CEOs, you know, felt that they, they weren't too, con they weren't confident predicting beyond the current uh, booking window, which is still 90 yeah. days out, so. But the results have been really uh, impressive. And Mexico kind of came out of the blocks first, even ahead of the U.S. and Canada. If you look at the traffic data at Aviva, Aerobus, uh, Valeris, Aeromexico, I mean, the, the rate of recovery was just unbelievable. Absolutely. I mean, they lost, they lost a player early on, Interjet, which, uh, and uh, I mean, Valeris has grown leaps and yeah. bounds. Aeromexico out of Chapter 11 is larger than it was yeah. going in. It's, it's impressive. So we, we've put a lot of A321neos at Valeris. Uh, they can't get enough of them. We've done a lot of 737-9s uh, at Aeromexico to cope with this huge traffic increase. Definitely. So speaking of, of airplanes, uh, you, of course, <laughs> deal with them every day. You know, what are you seeing in the aircraft market right now? Uh, you know, we, we saw a lot of narrow body interest early in the pandemic. I've heard that wide bodies are gaining interest again. What, uh, what, what trends are you seeing in the market right now? Well, both Boeing and Airbus substantially reduced their production output in addition to the fact that the 737s were grounded and uh, 737 MAX production came to halt and then 787 production was basically uh, non-existent for about 18, 19 months. But I think right now we're seeing demand is very strong, particularly for the larger single aisle aircraft. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, Airbus just can't keep up with demand on the A321neo. Do you think uh, we'll get the MAX 10 certification anytime soon? That's up to the FAA and EASA. Uh, but that's a little more complicated in terms of systems and aerodynamics than the 737-7. So I think the Dash 7, which is a baby brother of the Dash 8, is, is going to be a little more straightforward. The Dash 10 has some other complexities. Right. Dash 10 is a little larger than the current 900 ERs, whereas the Correct. Dash 7 fits within the current. Right. The Dash 7 is yeah. roughly the size of a 737-400. Right. It's kind of between the 700 and the 800. Uh, fuselage size, but it's basically the same platform, the same engines, the same systems. So you would think that would be pretty straightforward. And Southwest is uh, certainly making a strong case in Washington. They've ordered how many hundreds of them at this I think point? 500 something. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Dash 10 is having a rougher time. They haven't had a lot of orders outside of North America. Uh, they've lost uh, most of their sales campaigns against the A321neo, but Look, Boeing has to be uh, in that market. They can't, they can't give up more market share. It's already close to like 60, 40, and at the rate things are going, it's gonna be like you know, low 60s to high 30s. So it's, it's very much favoring Airbus, uh, which is not an ideal situation for the airlines and, and the customers. Right. You wanna have a reasonable equilibrium right. between these two giants. Well, it only, it's potential to only get worse because of uh, a Boeing CEO, Calhoun, mentioned the other week that they're not considering a new new yeah. aircraft until the next decade. I mean, that's... Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think there's several reasons for that. One is that it's very difficult to forecast the impact of new technologies and the feasibility and economics of these new technologies, whether it's electric or hydrogen, when you go out to, say, 2035 and beyond. So... Why would a company invest today 15 to 20 billion dollars to develop an airplane that's essentially today's technology with maybe a few percentage points uh, improvement in fuel and environmental economics? But then that's offset by the high capital cost. Right. 
So there, there's not a meaningful uh, step change improvement achievable with the current platforms that are out there today. And that was the challenge that we saw with uh, part of the challenge with the NMA. I mean, yeah. they, they were looking at today's technology in an airplane that would be flying uh, for the next, you know, if it had come out in the next 30 years, well, into the 2050s, yeah. 2060s. Sorry for our audience, the NMA is the new mid-market airplane. We called it the 797. <laughs> the it seven. was never built. <laughs> yes, uh, Boeing was considering it, and then Calhoun canceled it early in yeah. his tenure. So what are you seeing on the wide-body side? Is, uh, well, the wide-body market took a much bigger hit. Right. Uh, because of the pandemic. And uh, A330, Neo production was down to like one, one and a half a month. As I said, 787 production went from like 10, it was supposed to go to 14 and drop down to zero. Triple seven X is like five years delayed. Yeah. Uh, 747 passenger production stopped. Uh, 777 Freighter is still doing well, and it's keeping the 777 line going until the X comes along. Uh, they're not building any more 777 300ER passenger aircraft, which has been a very successful product. So that's come to an end. So Boeing's got to refocus on the 787, 9, 10, yeah. and uh, get the uh, the 78. I mean, this 777, 9X certified. Right. Which is a huge challenge. It's got huge cost overruns. And uh, my guess is they'll probably lose money on every airplane because of the, uh, the R&D and the cost of keeping that program alive. And uh, the fact that they have to stop escalation. Airlines are not going to pay escalation for those delays. Right. And then there's also the question with the 9X, is it's, it's not a composite aircraft. It's a, it's a you know, will it be competitive in terms of weight with the A350-1000, yeah. which I'm not, maybe not exactly the same size, but they're close. The, the advantage Boeing has there is that there's such a large embedded fleet of 777s uh, and 787s, so it's easy for an airline to transition to a 777X. But it's a very expensive airplane, cost per seat, uh, the engine, we still have to see how reliable the engine is compared to the uh, uh, to the G90. Definitely. So, Boeing has their work cut out. They absolutely do. But Boeing's not alone. I mean, we we heard a little bit from Robert Isom earlier about the the delivery constraints, and and uh, those are issues at Airbus too. I mean, what's what's happening there on the supply chain side? Yeah, every every plane last year and this year is delayed. We we haven't gotten one airplane on time, whether it's a 737 Max or a 787, or an A330, A350. And the worst has been the A321 Neo in Hamburg, Germany. Oh, wow. uh, we've had delays as much as six or seven months uh, comparing contract delivery months to actual delivery. And it's, it's a combination of supply chain issues, uh, ramping up too quickly, uh, shortage of labor, uh, you know, production workers can't work from home. So it, it's been a real problem. And uh, we've also had engine shortages where both Pratt and Whitney can't deliver enough GTFs to uh, Airbus. Uh, CFM cannot deliver enough leap engines to uh, Boeing and Airbus. So we've had gliders sitting at the uh, final assembly plants without engines. Which is crazy. Gliders being, yeah. An airplane no, 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 no. That's without engines. Right which you almost never see. Yeah. So these are problems that have really become acute. And um, you know, airplanes that were supposed to deliver in the springtime for a high summer season now deliver in November. So it's not an optimal situation for our customers. Absolutely not. Do you see the issues easing in the near future or are they no. already easing? No, I think they'll get worse before they get better. Oh, wow. So we're looking easily 2023, 2024. Before. Yeah, and one of the reasons is that both Boeing and Airbus are, uh, well, Boeing is trying to get to a, a steady 31 a month on, on the 737, and Airbus is progressively increasing production rates. And a lot of the suppliers, not just first tier, but second, third tier suppliers, are already at their maximum production output levels. So we're... we're we're having some concerns whether the OEMs can meet their uh, production targets. Definitely. And I mean, and, I mean, 
while it is a concern, it also is benefiting yields because capacity is artificially exactly. constrained and you know, airlines. But and that's a global situation right now. All right, we've got a couple audience questions here uh, while we're talking about out Boeing. Um, how about, so efficiency. Every next gen aircraft is 20% more efficient than previous generations. Are you finding that airlines are going more and more for newer aircraft from a sustainability point of view than, uh, yeah. Look, it's been very difficult to uh, follow this roller coaster on oil prices. If you, if you go back the last 10 years, I mean, I remember when Goldman Sachs was predicting $150 a barrel, then it got down to 40, and now it's like around 91. And so fuel cost is, is one of the most important and largest uh, cost components for an airline. So every airline is seeking fuel efficiency uh, in the long term. And, and so 20% is, is a very significant number. But that's offset by the higher capital cost of new planes, right. the fact that the reliability of the new engines uh, on all of these new products has not been at the same level as the, uh, the previous generation engines. So engine maintenance costs are running much higher, and they offset a, a large part of the fuel savings. Right. And then you have the, the constraints we just talked about in terms of supply chain, that if an airline exactly. wants to recover its capacity, it maybe needs to keep some of its more of yeah. its older planes around to, to do that right. than it otherwise would have. I mean, a good example of that, historically, 60% of our leases are extended by the first operator. Uh, now we're running at like 93, 94% extension rate because airlines don't have the confidence that they'll get their new deliveries on time. So... They want to protect their network and extend leases one, two, three, four years uh, on existing A320s, 737s, uh, 777s, A330s. Wow. And that's sort of helping stabilize the uh, market equilibrium for used aircraft as well. I mean, that's good. We were seeing a lot of used aircraft early in the pandemic, and now yeah. it's, uh, it's... They've been dumped. absorbed. The good ones have been absorbed. Good, good. I mean, that's good for you guys and stuff. Yeah. The, your that, remarketing team must be uh, not have much work to do at the moment. Well, they're, they're selling some of these older assets. And then we've also had a huge amount of uh, activity in converting passenger aircraft to cargo. For example, the 737-800, the older ones that are more than 10, 12 years old, a lot of them are getting converted. A321s are being converted. Uh, A330s are being converted. Um, Triple seven conversions are about to get underway. Seven, six, seven, 300 ER conversions. So a lot of these used aircraft found a second lease of, uh, on their lives through the cargo market, which of course had this tremendous uh, uh, level act of activity when uh, all the large wide bodies were, you know, basically not flying uh, anywhere near where they were before. Right. I think uh, one of our uh, popular term that was coined then was praters, where uh, exactly. airlines would pull the seats out, but otherwise leave it in a passenger layout and fill right. it with cargo. So I don't think most people understand that the majority of air freight flies in the belly of passenger aircraft. So when we had this huge compression of uh, wide body flying during the pandemic, the all cargo aircraft and the, and the aircraft that were sort of semi passenger, semi cargo airplanes. Uh, took on the uh, load, and, and so that gave that segment of the market a tremendous uh, boost. Definitely. So one uh, segment that's emerging that, that we haven't talked about is are the electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. There's uh, lots of MOUs and commitments by airlines for hundreds of them out there. Um, you know, I, I want to be clear that this is not, they are not a solution to replace current flying. They, they create a new market, urban air mobility, getting someone from, you know, we're, we're sitting here in da downtown Dallas to DFW, for example. What, is, what are your thoughts of the EV toll market? Well, they're laboratories for new technologies. Uh, so it kind of reminds me of the uh, U.S. automobile industry in the 1920s, where you had hundreds of companies building cars and and then uh, most of them either went bankrupt or there was consolidation. So it's very difficult to forecast which of these uh, companies that have raised billions and billions of uh, dollars of money uh, will actually succeed 
and be economically uh, sustainable. Um, we, we, we highly respect what they're trying to do. Uh, it's, it's attacking a segment of the market that has not existed before. And as Robert Isom indicated, one of the key uh, challenges will be the uh, air traffic control at low altitudes and uh, in bad weather. And uh, our ATC system is not equipped to handle this high density uh, urban flying at low altitudes. We, we just don't have the, the infrastructure to deal with that. Absolutely. So, and we have air traffic control staffing as it is with major metro areas. Uh, Exactly. At, for the current planes we have, let alone adding every yeah. 10 minute EV toll flights. Yeah. And then a lot of these uh, companies want to then transition to autonomous uh, vehicles. In other words, initially they'll have a pilot, but they're all being designed to eventually become autonomous. So that's another big question. Who really controls those airplanes from the ground? What are the qualifications they'll need? Uh, certainly several steps above just flying a drone. Right. And then again, this interface with the ATC system and dealing with high energy electric wires that, that could become you know, fatal to these smaller uh, vehicles. So there's a lot of challenges, but I commend all of the uh, quest for new technology, both hydrogen and electric, but it's gonna take a few decades to have applications on what I call the mainline airline uh, right. segment of the industry. Right, absolutely. I mean, we've, I know you've spoken before, batteries uh, are just not a feasible solution for a long haul aircraft. They just don't have the energy density and you know, maybe hydrogen. And weight, is, weight. Weight, exactly, yeah. You know, in a car, if you have another 500 pounds of batteries, okay, you can, you can make, make it work because you can design lighter structure of, of the automobile, but aviation, weight is the enemy. And the more weight you have, the more uh, power you need and so it's kind of uh, chasing your own tail. It's, it's, it's a difficult solution. Definitely. It's going to take some, take some work. Now, on EV tolls, I have to ask, Air Lease has not uh, jumped into the race for EV tolls yet. Are you, are you guys looking at uh, buying some? Or? No, it's, it's a beauty contest where we have 100 contestants, and we, we have a trouble picking the, the winner and the runner-up. So we, we're, we're watching the movie carefully. That's a good place to be. Let the market sort itself out and then right. you, can, you can swoop in. Plus, we would not get any revenue from any of those for a long time. And one of the issues for a, a capital investment company like us that we buy, you know, billions of dollars of aircraft every year is what is the residual value of one of these products five years after it was built? You know, right now, commercial aircraft have a life of at least 25 years. And if they're converted to cargo, it could go to 35 years. Right. What's the useful life of one of these little uh, EV you know, Yeah. EV tolls. <laughs> we don't know, you know. And will they be obsolete in three to five years? Right. Uh, because there'll be new, you know, better technologies and efficiencies. So better batteries, maybe larger aircraft instead of yeah. four pass. Yeah. We'll, so we'll let other more adventurous investors deal with that. <laughs> that sounds good. Well. Mr. Hazi, it's been a pleasure to have you here Thank at the Skift man. Aviation Forum. It's, uh, you know, we welcome your you know, depth of knowledge in the aviation industry Thank here you. and stuff. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of the Airline Weekly Lounge podcast. Check out AirlineWeekly.com for a new issue every Monday and updates on the latest airline news throughout the week.